Hello, we are live streaming here on Facebook on the Whedon Unleashed Facebook page and Unleashed the podcast. And I always do this when I have great guests to interview, but uh, I'll be getting to Phil Simchich here in just a second. Thank you, first of all, to all of you joining me, either if you're going to, uh, to, to catch on here on the live stream, or if you're listen, listening to now episode number 10 of the Unleashed the Podcast. I've hit double digits. That must mean something. Uh, and I'm excited that number 10 is a longtime colleague and great friend from the great white north. Last time I had Dean Robinson from down under. Now I'm going up north to Regina, Saskatchewan to talk to Phil Simchich. Uh, again, before I go to Phil, you can catch every episode of Unleash the Podcast by going to Google Podcast, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or Spotify, subscribing, giving me a five. I'd ask you to give me a six, but you can only go up to five. Give me a five, catch every episode because we have lots of fun here. And Phil, uh, welcome. Welcome to Unleash the Podcast. Thanks, Dan. Great to be here. Congratulations on number 10. And I'm honored and will definitely try and put a marketing spin on being 10. Well, well I, maybe, maybe I should send you some sort of a gift. But let me tell everybody who Phil Simchich is. Phil is an expert on helping mid-market companies grow. His SME, Business Wealth Builder, uh, helps them grow their services, helps them grow profitability, uh, helps them throughout any type of situation that we have economically, whether we're in a crisis or we're in great times. Phil helps them chart a course to greater profits and growth. And one of the reasons I want to have Phil on here was to talk about a newsletter that he just put out a few weeks ago on four ways to grow your business. And I know during this pandemic time that we are kind of working our way through and hopefully out of soon, businesses are going to want to know how to grow their business. So Phil, welcome. Before I start uh, pounding away at you with some questions, tell everybody a little bit more about you and SME Wealth Builder. Sure. Great. Thanks, Dan. So um, I originally got interested in business and, and pursued business education and credentials and all those things because of my family business experience. So when I was a teenager, my parents and my aunt and uncle bought a small 22-room seasonal lodge. So it was only open full-time two months of the year. And interest rates were 23%, not 2 or 3% like they are now. They're 23% per year. And they went to the accountant and he said, don't buy the business. It doesn't make any money. And they went to the bank and they said, well, you all have good jobs and you've got good credit history and, and you have good equity in your homes. The business should be able to pay us back. We'll lend you the money. And so fortunately, things have changed since then. A, interest rates have come down. B, bankers are much more sophisticated and proactive as strategic business partners. But that, that was stressful times. Like we ate a lot of beans in our house because there was no money for anything else. And that causes its own problems. So when you grow up in a house full of problems and business stress and all sorts of emotional and difficult discussions about family shareholdings, it, it, it burned in me that emotional trauma that I want to help other people prevent this. So I've come from a small business background. And that's driven me to achieve uh, different business experiences and, and credentials uh, and um, really to position myself to help uh, small and mid-market companies to grow. And growth is about do you have good strategy, do you have a good leadership team, and do you have the resources for the team to execute the strategy. And, and so let's, let's get on to the, the four ways to grow the business and, uh, and then we'll start talking some stories too. Oh, absolutely. But I do have one thing before, because it's a question I wanted to ask, kind of the elephant in the room. We, I had you on the Shrimp Tank podcast right at the start of COVID. And obviously, this has been a global thing. So as we kind of set the stage for the four ways to grow the business, you've been working with businesses who have been managing the last six months. I'll use the word managing. Uh, 
what are some of, if you had one or two things that you could give as advice and wisdom for those just from a mindset standpoint, before we go into the four ways to grow, just from where their mindset should be in September of 2020, as we're still in the midst of this, but looking forward to uh, rosier times. Do you have any one or two points that you'd be able to give folks? Well, we're in interest rates, we're 23%, which were beyond our control. We, we did the best we could with what we had. So my advice right now, is recalibrate your mindset as if COVID is here to stay for a longer term, it's not gone by Christmas. So when you accept that, you're exerting control over the situation and over your reality. So number one, adopt a reality mindset. Number two, be optimistic. And yes, uh, businesses, some are managing, some are just getting hammered and some will right. not survive. And that's unfortunate and, and sad. And I was on a podcast the other day where um, Sir Richard Branson, in, in responding to a similar question, said in, um, I, I don't know, several hundred years ago, incorporated companies came into being. Before then, they threw people in jail for not paying their debts. Now, you wind up your company, you pull the pin. He said, don't spend more than a day worrying about it and then get back to doing what you do and start over. So worst case scenario is go through the pain process as quickly as possible and protect yourself and your family and get good professional advice on how to do that and and then step on the gas and and number three take care of yourself it doesn't matter what you're doing make sure you're getting exercise make sure you're eating healthy and getting enough sleep and and don't be self-medicating with things that aren't conducive to good health and good performance because you're just making the situation worse and it can quickly become unmanageable Take care of yourself. If you're a business owner and an entrepreneur, then you are the equivalent, and, and, I'll, and I'll specifically state much more valuable than a multi-million dollar athlete because you directly impact your local economy and your company and your employees and their families and your suppliers and your customers and, and everybody's families. So take damn good care of yourself and then step on the gas. Full speed ahead, as you know I say. I know you say so. Here we're going to go full speed ahead into four ways to grow your business. This came from Phil's Business Wealth Builder newsletter. I'm going to encourage everybody listening to subscribe to it like I do because there's great wealth that comes from it each time. Phil, I'm sure at the end will tell you how to do that. The four ways to grow your business, uh, it's right at the start of the, of the article. Four ways to grow your business. Number one, increase the number of customers. Number two, increase the average transaction value. Number three, increase transaction frequency. And number four, improve efficiency. Phil, I'm gonna take these one at a time. Let's start with number one, increase the number of customers of the type that you want. And I think that's important. Everybody might say, well, of course, yeah, we wanna increase the number of customers, clients we have, but there's more to it. Can you expand on that? Sure. You know, either you're a small business right now, or as you grow into a mid-market company and you're suffering from small business-itis in that you think any customer is a good customer. And there's customers, I guarantee, where you're losing money and you'd be better off to hand them a 20 or a 50 or a $100 bill when they walk in the door and say, please don't ever come back. You would be way further ahead than losing thousands of dollars and burning up employee time and energy and morale and capacity and harming your brand because you've got the wrong customer. So it's a sign of maturity and wisdom and good strategy to be very clear on who is a good customer. And when you identify who is a good customer, then you pursue them. And you pursue them by demonstrating your value, ideally your quantifiable value, and explaining and showing them and involving them in how they can get a positive return on investment and ROI in dealing with you. Now I'm talking, B2B, business to business, and it's typically a lot easier to measure performance and value in a, in a B2B transaction, but this still, applies, this still applies to the hotel business that I grew up in. It applies to restaurants. It applies to my men's store who only write me and send me a postcard when they're having a sale. So they're just attracting customers who are price conscious instead of um, reaching out and saying, hey, we've got something that will look 
you know how hard it is to buy a blue shirt to look good on Zoom? <laughs> and, and so, hey, we've got six different kinds of blue shirts in, in stock. Uh, and I know you're a blue shirt guy for Zoom. So come on down and try them out. That would, that would be, but no, I only hear about them when they're, when they're pushing a sale. So identify your best customers and then attract them by communicating with them proactively. Give them free advice. Give them free samples. Um, when I was in the hotel business and my mom was the manager yeah, and, and, and so she was there running the place. Um, she had full-time hours in, in May, June and September. And one weekend she couldn't be there. She left me a 20 something in, in charge. So this gentleman walked in, he took one look at me and started to back out. I said, how can I help? He says, well, we're looking for some room. So I gave him a few keys and said, go look around. And he comes back down. He, obviously he was concerned about my youth. And he says, well, we don't exactly, I, you don't really have what I want. I said, what do you want? He says, I want a quiet room. I said, okay. And, and I knew uh, quiet and clean were the two value propositions that we had. I said, why don't you stay the night for free? If it's a quiet night and you're happy, then you can pay me whatever you want the next day. And if it's not quiet and not to your satisfaction, um, no charge. So he said, okay, he took me up on the offer. Now, he didn't know what I knew, which the place was practically empty. There was no crying babies because we didn't have all of them. <laughs> there was no golfers, no offense to golfers, getting up at four in the morning and then staying up late partying, right? So we, had, we, had knew, we knew who our ideal customer was and it wasn't families with little kids or, or golfers or, or partiers. So he stayed, he slept well, he paid, he came back because I, I knew he was the right customer and he kept coming back every year for the week holidays plus bringing family and friends. And so that's an example of knowing who your customer is and then doing whatever you can. Don't just spend five or 10 grand on the dark arts of social media or, um, or advertising blindly, find a specific customer and then make them an offer or two or three they can't refuse, build the relationship and trust and credibility and grow. And then that person is going to refer and referral is far more effective and, and powerful than um, mail advertising or social media or any advertising. So Phil, that, that kind of then leads into number two, increasing the average transaction value. Now, obviously, we, there's, there's many different uh, industries. Uh, there's many different types of customers and clients. Uh, you have B2B and B2C. Can you talk in, in some general terms about how do you increase a transaction value? I was working with an $8 million industrial service company, steel toe boots, wrench pullers, right? Hardworking guys. And they were charging their clients 50 bucks an hour and they were crisscrossing the, the prairies in the middle of winter, uh, fixing broken down equipment for Fortune 100 companies. Like these guys were good at fixing stuff. They could fix anything. And then I showed up, 8 million in revenues, about 65 employees. And I said, what are you guys really good at uh, fixing stuff? Yeah, but what are you really, really good at? Well, we're good at keeping stuff running. Right, so if we showed up, could you proactively tell customers what piece might need repairing and whatnot? Yeah, so we shifted their strategy. Strategy is very important. Strategy is the tip of the arrow. We shifted their strategy from being reactive repair specialist to proactive planned maintenance. Mm. And we added some language and metrics in there that are pretty interesting for Fortune 100 companies, like your return on assets, like maximizing uptime, like helping them quantify their downtime. If a big uh, grain terminal, so some people may understand or be able to visualize these are right. on the side of a rail line. And if they're broken down and they can't accept the train, they lose $50,000 hmm. for that lost train. And that was 10, 15 years ago. So that number is probably even bigger because trains are longer now. And so we shifted from reactive repair to proactive plan maintenance with a demonstrable ROI for the client, return on assets, uptime, and, and a lot of hard metrics. And, and this is what their customers wanted. The customers didn't know they wanted or needed to maximize their uptime. They just wanted to fix stuff that broke as quickly as possible. So help your customer think about the future and how to create a better future and understand where, where you fit and you may, if you provide service, you may need to consult for free. If you provide product, you may need to provide samples for free, but you won't have to do this forever or for long once you create some successes with your clients. We were able to more than double their hourly rate. And more importantly, we were able to load level them much better. 
So instead of them running around here and running around there and leaving some customers stranded and unhappy, we were able to proactively schedule customers in, including during slower times, and do more inside work during cold winters and, and things like that. And so it was a very strategic, proactive approach. Anybody can do this with a whiteboard, with a phone call, um, with a Zoom call with your customer as to, okay, when things, like, um, I was on the phone with a, a coach this week, he asked a great question, what drives you crazy? So it's a fantastic question. So ask your customers what drives them crazy and then help them solve that. And then that's, and provide more value, ideally quantify and demonstrate that value and then you can raise your prices. Customers are not price sensitive. They're I value love, sensitive. I, I love it, the what drives you crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, that was a that was a great, great quote. Um, I, I hadn't heard that before. So here, so we, we're, we've talked about increasing the number of customers. We've talked about increasing the average transaction value. Number three, we want to do it more often, increase transaction frequency. Talk a little sure. bit about that, Phil. So the unsophisticated approach back to Clear Lake Lodge, pre-internet, right? Um, Pre-trip advisor, pre-anything social media. So for transaction frequency, we wrote them and mailed them a letter, snail mail, and made them offers for off season to come back in September, October. The colors are just gorgeous at the lake. There's no bugs because it's cold, um, but it's sunny. And, and, and so come back um, during off season, or here's a special deal to stay longer during regular season but get them coming back my, my back to my men's store. Don't write me when <laughs> stuff's on sale. I know you have sales in January and, and July, right? Write me when new stuff comes in and, and, and uh, be proactive uh, restaurants. So, okay. Yeah. We get our, our coupon when it's a birthday month or an anniversary month. It's a new month. It's a new season. Um, what are you doing? What's in season for, for vegetables? What can you make locally? that's unique and different that I can't get when I'm traveling, which most of us aren't traveling anymore. And, and so how can, um, how can you make, if you're in the hospitality and, and retail, how can you make your business more interesting right now for people that, that can't travel? How can you, well, going back to number one, number of customers, finding customers, asking for referrals, but giving them value and offers to share, to bring their friends, to um, maybe it's a special Thursday night dinner tonight. You know, we've got lamb. My wife loves lamb. Yeah. So if you've got a lamb special on, uh, we're, we're in line. And, and proactively communicating with your customers throughout the year, not just when there's a problem, because that's usually when they call you. Ideally, when you've got something new and exciting, I, I'm working with a, a small firm. And, and again, it's, it's technical B2B. And he's a marketing master. He's creating case studies. He's contacting customers and former customers every week. He's going out to visit because he can socially distance and he's got all the PPE and he's qualified. And he's doing some really cool stuff with his technology in industrial environments that might be temporarily shut down due to COVID or due to slower economic times. But he's helping them think and plan for the future. So be proactive and, and be helpful to your clients. So the last one, and I'm going to read from here, we, we want to talk about efficiency, which, which I think is, goes into uh, all of the, what you've just talked about. It says efficiency can be measured in different ways. One way is to take your total selling, general, and administrative expenses and divide by the number of transactions you have. So we're talking about transaction frequency. This will give you your cost per transaction. Another way is to take your net profit and divide by your number of transactions to give you the profit per transaction. My guess is, is not as many small and medium sized businesses are taking that level of uh, quantitative data. Uh, if somebody were not, let me ask it to you this way. If somebody were not taking that, um, some tips on how to get started. You can figure out efficiency by dividing your top line revenues, which just about everybody knows, by how many employees you have, which just about everybody knows. So there's your gross revenue per employee. Um, the, the one you're uh, selling general and admin expenses over transactions. So that's how much overhead you're charging each transaction. So if you have $50 of overhead per transaction and you're selling some stuff at $25, 
you're not covering your overhead on on that transaction never mind the product cost and and, and other direct costs and and so it, this isn't complicated math it's common sense math but you need to sit down and and figure it out and it's not jumping out at you in your financial statements because they're prepared in accordance with gap or whatever accounting standards you use for external users to neutralize industries well, the worst thing accountants have done is put every, all the action revenue in one line. But that's where all the act, how many customers times how many times did they buy? Times what was the transaction frequency? That's all in, in revenue. And so everything we're talking about today uh, for the first three is expanding on that revenue. Um, so l- but let me, um, operational efficiency, I, I want to make three sure. points in addition to the math. Number one, engage your people. That will automatically make you and them more efficient. And you engage them by asking them, um, what do you like about your day to day? What drives you crazy, mm-hmm. right? What what do we do that wastes time or that doesn't make sense? What would you do if you owned the company? What would you do different in your role? Do you need two monitors? Do you need two big 24 inch monitors? Or do you have data intensive people working on crappy technology, which is just, it's a bono, it's 200 bucks per, per monitor. And, and so engage your people by asking them how, they want to uh, contribute advice on making their jobs better and also on educating and growing their skills. They're not rocks. They want to learn and grow, <laughs> right? Yep. With every pair of hands, you get a free brain and a free heart. And it's management's job not just to switch these up, but to engage them. And so be proactive and have conversations, ideally one-on-one. They'll tell you a lot one-on-one. I've learned fascinating things that have helped my um, clients grow and increase engagement and spend virtually no money. The water cooler is always empty. Well, let's get a plumber in here and direct line the filter and, and we're never out of water, like 200 bucks. And, and so what are the things that are annoying your team? And then what are the things that make them more productive? And then what are the things that make them more effective? And more effective is again, aligning with strategy and making sure they understand how they contribute to, to strategy. And then eliminate waste and bad habits, because if it's not contributing to the greater good of adding value to your customer, why are you doing it? And then number three, be unreasonable. Um, I I took on a a project a a while ago. And so the the, uh, the, top financial people in the financial department, like many companies, prepared a quarterly board report and a monthly board report. This monthly board report, when I showed up, was about that thing. It was 80 pages. 80 pages. It's well known globally that every board member gets way too much information that they can't understand. So I've worked with a company and the, the board report has gone from 80, eight, zero pages down to 18 pages, mm. one eight pages. So there's almost an 80% improvement in, in that. And, and they only need three pages to know what's going on. Right. There's a, a monthly one-page narrative that has the highlights. There's a one-page balance sheet that compares um, to prior year and, and to budget. And then there's a one-page P&L, also comparing to prior year and to budget. Everything's got vertical percents and we up dollars and percent and on one, on one page. So there's a lot of data there that shows trends and patterns that people can get into. So be unreasonable in making your information better and more effective for whoever's using it. Because your entire company is full of managers that are trying to make decisions on imperfect information. Fine. But get them better information. Get them daily information. Daily flash, which I've written about and talked about a lot, involves how much did we sell today or yesterday? How much? So that was sales to customers. How much did we produce or deliver today, yesterday? And then what's our financial position? How much cash do we have in a bank? Well, how, how old are receivables? And so when you have the management team look at those numbers on a daily basis, the flash, sales, production, and uh, financial position, and you get a multidisciplinary management team, now you got finance, and you got sales, and you got operations, and you got marketing all talking about the same thing. Amazing things will happen. Those meetings are messy at, at the start. And amazing things come out of that because you've got them talking in real time. Now it's like a football huddle during the football game. It matters. Everybody's paying attention. Nobody's, they're not checking their phones. They're not sending texts when they're in the huddle because they have a limited amount of time to deal with real information that they can develop 
make decisions, develop actions and, and go and implement right away. Well, what's been amazing is, is talking to you and getting such incredibly valuable uh, information for any small and medium sized business owner to really grow their business. It's been a tough year in a lot of ways. Uh, and, and so we're looking forward to fourth quarter of this year and, and 2021. So as we, as we go out, before I ask you to how people can find you, I find you know, a couple of quotes that you had at the end. One, Peter Drucker said, the purpose of business is to serve a customer. And this is a Phil Simchich quote, the purpose of growing your business is to serve more customers and to build your business wealth. I don't know of anybody who helps companies build their business wealth better than Phil Simchich. So Phil, uh, how do people get on your newsletter? How do people get your book? And how do people contact you? Uh, the easiest way is to go to my website, smewealthbuilder.com. And anybody's listening, if you want to send me an email, it's phil, P-H-I-L, at smewealthbuilder.com. And I'll send you a free ebook on the four ways to grow your business. So it's a compilation of the information you've heard today with some more stories and more tools on how to implement this in your business. And uh, you can always phone me, 306 Nine nine two six one seven seven, and you pick up the phone. And by the way, for those lis listening on the live stream, on the podcast page and on my website page where I have the video, I will make sure that all Phil's information is readily available. Uh, Phil, I want to thank you very much uh, for joining us today. Great information uh, that I know will help many, many a business owner go full speed ahead. Uh, this has been another great edition. It's number 10. We hit dub double digits, Unleashed the Podcast. Again, a reminder, go to unleashedthepodcast.com and you can subscribe in a myriad. We're ubiquitous around, uh, around the dial, so to speak. Uh, go subscribe and catch us on a regular basis. Uh, we have many more guests lined up coming up. I want to again thank Phil Simchich, uh, SME Wealth Builder. I'll have all of his information for right now. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Stay tuned for more of these in the future. Be safe out there. There's a lot of crazy things, including a lot of smoke in my area. So if you're around here, uh, breathe good air, wear your mask, uh, be well, and above all, be unleashed. <laughs>